Welcome back and let's get started on our final um, uh, segment of the um, second day of the virtual event at the um, CNI uh, 2021 fall member meeting. And uh, we have two presentations to round out our day. Um, I am really delighted to welcome uh, Riz Ali um, from the National Security Research Center at Los Alamos. Um, Los Alamos is an amazing place that has um, uh, given a lot, produced a lot of innovation that's turned out to be very important for our community over the years. Um, uh, you may recall that uh, Paul Ginsberg's uh, um, preprint archive started at Los Alamos. Uh, many of you will know um, the great body of work from Herbert von de Sampel, who spent time at Los Alamos. And um, today, I um, am really pleased that we'll be able to learn about another um, very interesting um, innovation um, that's uh, being done at Los Alamos. Um, uh, it's um, basically, as I understand it, and we'll understand it a lot better shortly, a uh, machine learning um, uh, uh, driven um, application of AI technology. And um, with that, I'm just going to say welcome, Riz. Thank you for joining us, and I'll turn it over to you. Well, Cliff, uh, thank you so much for uh, inviting me to speak. Uh, it's uh, truly, it's an honor. I mean, I get your emails on a very regular basis, and I'm uh, just thrilled to be uh, able to present this to uh, the CNI community. So uh, just to give you a little background about myself uh, before I get started on the, on the briefing, I've been the director of the National Security, Security Research Center for the last couple of years. Um, and I'll go into a little bit of history about the NSRC. Uh, I, my background really is in IT and cybersecurity. So uh, the AI work that we did over here is right uh, within my um, within my, within my expertise. I learn on a daily basis about the archiving and uh, and library uh, work that my staff is doing over here. But it's just uh, been a truly wonderful experience trying to introduce uh, the, uh, these innovative technologies over uh, here at Los Alamos. So uh, a little bit about us, um, the NSRC is the Los Alamos' classified library. So we have actually two different libraries at, at Los Alamos. One is our unclassified library, which is called the Research Library. The classified library is uh, the National Security Research Center. The NSRC is by far the larger uh, of the two entities, but you know only a select number of people are able to access uh, the material because it's uh, uh, all the material is classified. The lineage of the organization actually dates back to uh, uh, J. Robert Oppenheimer in 1943, when he formed a, uh, stood up the Technical Library as part of the Manhattan Project. So the the uh, over the course of many decades, uh, the a lot of many archives and many libraries popped up at Los Alamos, and somewhere around the 90s, uh, a lot of them started getting consolidated uh, together. So uh, about three years ago, uh, when I started at the, at the laboratory, uh, there were two major uh, uh, classified libraries uh, still in existence. Uh, one held the physical collections, one held the digital collections, and uh, there was a project started to consolidate that and, and to form the National Security Research Center. So this uh, center over here really houses about 75 plus years of scientific engineering work on a classified side uh, areas of, uh, um, uh, of the work that the, lab, uh, that the laboratory does. And our goal is all, has always been to offer services similar to major university libraries. So it, uh, to that effect, you know, I've got a fully trained staff of librarians, archivists, digitizers, uh, communication specialists, historians. It's fairly large staff uh, that support uh, the operations of the of the NSRC. So that this uh, give you a little bit of a sampling of the type of material that we have within our collections. Everything from uh, physics to nuclear testing and material sciences, uh, environmental science, uh, lab history, uh, even. Uh, a uh, uh, topic that most people don't even know about, you know, the, the U.S. experimented with uh, nuclear propulsion, so we hold the, the archives for that. So obviously with the, our 
uh, the nation's uh, rush to uh, uh, go to Mars, you know, that's become a pretty popular topic with, uh, uh, with a lot of information requests that we've been getting on that uh, particular topic. And uh, the volume of material that we have, uh, this is completely germane to, uh, to the artificial intelligence work that we've been doing is just uh, trying to quantify exactly how much uh, physical material that we have. Uh, everything from art aperture cards to uh, uh, videotapes to radiographs, which are uh, x-rays of uh, nuclear weapons, uh, um, physical reports, microfilm, microfiche, I mean, you name it, if you've got a, a large, large collection, somewhere in the order of about 14 million pieces of information. Uh, so it, it does make us one of the largest uh, libraries within the federal government. It's a fairly extensive collection of, uh, of uh, items that we have. Um, vast majority of our collections has not been digitized. So we estimate uh, it's a bit less than 10% has been digitized. And out of that, less than 10% has actually been uh, cataloged and indexed and made available to our researchers. So it, we're talking about less than 1%, and that's uh, very unacceptable <laughs> results. You know, uh, after 10 years of working on trying to get this stuff digitized and made available to our uh, researchers. So as I mentioned, uh, you know, less than 10% of the stuff has been digitized. Everything from um, all these different uh, 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 materials that we have within our uh, collection, including the uh, very uh, large collection of uh, card catalog, which is about 750,000 items uh, in and of itself. And uh, uh, we've been trying to digitize this stuff for about 10 years, and it's been uh, a slow going process as you know, many of you have probably realized when you try to digitize large volumes of materials, it's not uh, particularly easy, but we did, uh, I spent about uh, uh, about nine months uh, going doing a deep dive analysis to find out exactly uh, where the bottlenecks are and uh, try to fix uh, our digitizing uh, uh, issues because it's really, uh, uh, the amount of material that we have, you know, we can't be waiting hundreds of years for uh, for the stuff to be digitized. We we needed uh, some high speed digitizing labs uh, to try to uh, solve the problem. So uh, I ended up visiting uh, a number of different organizations, uh, such as uh, uh, NARA, uh, the George H. W. Bush Presidential Library, uh, Purdue University Library System, um, uh, some commercial organizations, um, uh, DOD organizations like the, like the National Reconnaissance Office, uh, all of them have high-speed digitization operations set up, and we wanted to see if we can apply any of their lessons learned and what they're doing over here at Los Alamos, because um, uh, doing things the current, uh, the old way of digitizing uh, and uh, doing quality checks was just not working uh, for, for the volume of material that we had. So uh, the result of that uh, really deep dive analysis was the standing up of uh, seven uh, brand new digitization labs, everything uh, from video, audio, microfilm, microfiche, you name it. I mean, we just, we, uh, we started off slow. Uh, the first lab we stood up was the video lab and then we uh, did the audio lab. And then um, after that, we did the motion picture films uh, digitization lab, and then uh, followed uh, quickly thereafter with the microfilm and microfiche labs. So obviously, you know, standing up new labs uh, was very expensive. Uh, I had to build a business case to, to get uh, the stuff uh, up and operational. And um, uh, the once these labs are up and operational, it really made the problem of uh, cataloging the material that we have uh, so much more difficult because uh, the, the the volume of material that we have in our digital lake, in fact, I call it a digital ocean, it's not even a lake, uh, uh, is, is so vast that there's almost no way that uh, you can uh, uh, catalog all that stuff uh, manually. And we have two additional labs that were planned for uh, 2022. You know, one is gonna be a, um, a small scale paper digitization lab. I just don't have physical space to set, it, set up a large scale lab right now, uh, but we are planning a, a small scale paper digitization lab. And then I also wanna set, set up an indexing lab to uh, help with some of the indexing uh, projects that we have going on. So, uh, you know, the, the, the reason for our, um, going for us going down the path of trying to 
uh, introduce artificial intelligence machine learning into uh, the library process over here is that our uh, the, the rate of um, cataloging the information, the, the digitized information that we have uh, is very slow. And um, anybody who's actually done cataloging work themselves know that uh, uh, you, there's almost no way that you can speed it up in a manual process. So we have a variety of different um, digital collections. You know, they have all sorts of different uh, metadata in, and indices, and some of them are just non-existent. You know, we we just we inherited these collections from uh, from old archives and old old libraries, and uh, some of the archivists and librarians are very meticulous about uh, putting indices and metadata data together, and some of them weren't. So it's just a, a large, diff, large and difficult to use uh, collection of um, indices and, um, and metadata. Um, the cataloging rate, again, I sat down for uh, uh, several weeks to try to figure out exactly what was going on with the cataloging rate and why we were, uh, uh, the process was so slow. Uh, the manual process for our material takes uh, about uh, 10 to 30 minutes per document. It's completely dependent on how, on how complex the document is, if it's just a one sheeter or if, or if it's uh, uh, you know, 150 sheets, uh, uh, because the, the cataloger has to extract the, the appropriate indexing information and, and metadata in order to put it into our uh, digital, digital repository. So uh, I, the analysis I did, and this is just, you know, the 2.4 million is just one of our digitized collections. It's not, doesn't encompass all of them. Um, it, uh, we, had, uh, we had about one and a half full-time full equivalent uh, staff working on it. Uh, at the rate that they were going, it was going to take us over 400 years to digitize. So then it kind of got me back into the, the same realm that we were in when we um, analyzed our digitizing rates. Uh, our microfilm collection would have taken us uh, about a uh, hundred years. To, uh, uh, sorry, microfiche collection would have taken us about a hundred years to digitize. Microfilm would have taken us about two thousand years. The cataloging was, gonna, uh, you know, would have taken us uh, four hundred years. And uh, with all this stuff going on with the high speed digitization labs, uh, that quantity of digitized collection is dramatically increasing on a daily basis. And there's no way that we can ever find enough um, people uh, to catalog all this information and uh, bring the material to um, our researchers who need to use it on a daily basis. So we kind of uh, set out uh, trying to find out exactly what is available in the market space. Um, there aren't that many companies that are doing this type of work, but uh, since with my military background, um, I, I was able to find some folks in the intelligence community who knew of companies that were doing almost this exact same type of work for the US intelligence community. So if you think about, uh, uh, let's take for example, the Osama bin Laden house, you know, when it was raided, the, the material had to be rapidly digitized and the digitized material had to be indexed, cataloged, and uh, natural language search had to be performed on it to make it available uh, uh, to intelligence analysts. Uh, obviously, Los Alamos is not in the, in the business of, of raiding uh, uh, terrorist houses, but uh, we do have similar uh, uh, requirements in terms of being able to rapidly digitize, uh, catalog, index, perform OCR, and make stuff available to researchers. So uh, we, uh, we kind of used that philosophy, and we did find uh, several companies that, uh, that did this type of work. Uh, mainly, uh, the, the, the reason we did go down the intelligence community route is because we do have some specialized security classification rules uh, that we need to implement over here because of the classified nature of our, um, of our holdings. So uh, the commercial companies, it would have taken them too long to build those things out. The, the folks that work with the intelligence community already had this stuff um, as part of their toolkit. So uh, that's one of the main reasons why we kind of went down that, that path. Um, I was able to uh, narrow, uh, interview about a dozen different companies, um, narrowed it down to uh, one company that, uh, that did the work that we needed. They, you know, they, they brought in some partners um, uh, to build out their suite. Um, I was able to find some money, uh, about uh, half a million dollars uh, to do a pilot. And now uh, the pilot went really well and we're in the process of getting that implemented on our classified networks. 
So uh, the goals really is that we wanted to provide an integrated search across document repositories, um, and we want our researchers to be able to uh, research this uh, material themselves. So that kind of uh, uh, necessitated that uh, the material had to be uh, the OCR had to be performed by the sync by this uh, tool. Um, all the metadata had to be extracted. Indexing information had to be extracted. All that stuff had to be done uh, in an uh, automated fashion, and then a natural language uh, search engine had to be uh, had to be developed in order to um, for for researchers to be able to find the material that they needed. So it, so the search results doesn't deliver just pure Boolean results, which would uh, give them maybe hundreds, if not thousands, of uh, of items that are completely irrelevant to them. It should have been it should be a natural language uh, search tool that they can actually get relevant information from. Um, uh, it's basically, it uses AI enabled um, engines, it's multiple engines, it's not just one engine that, uh, that pulls all this information out. Um, uh, there's, uh, the extraction mechanism is AI based, there's an AI based optical character recognition system, uh, which actually works on pre 1984 fonts, which some of you may know if you've done uh, OCR work is that uh, Adobe, um, you know, they basically uh, focus on uh, computer generated fonts, the typewriter fonts, it has really difficult time with uh, the, the system that we needed uh, had to be able to recognize uh, uh, older fonts uh, that were generated by typewriters. And then, uh, uh, you know, being able to extract all this stuff automatically without human intervention uh, was, uh, was key. And then uh, we also wanted uh, the natural language processing. So um, the natural language processing, if, if uh, and I'm sure that I don't think there's any person on the planet who's not used Google. Google uses a natural language search uh, system. Um, uh, they rely on uh, millions of uh, search results in order uh, and people clicking on uh, relevant items to be able to build those uh, relationships. So uh, for this particular tool, we would only have thousands of people, not millions of people, and maybe only hundreds of uh, uh, search results uh, um, processed daily. So it, uh, it, in that low volume of, uh, of material, there wouldn't be enough material, uh, there wouldn't be enough data for um, an AI system to automatically build some of the stuff, uh, some of the interrelationships between the data. So this, the search system actually uses a combination of uh, AI-based natural language processing, as well as um, uh, a human built ontology system to, to, uh, to make the connections between all the data elements so that the uh, relevant search results are uh, turned up for, uh, for our customers. So uh, all this stuff together is what, um, what, we, uh, what we've turned this project Titan on the Red. Um, it delivers, uh, we're hoping that it's gonna be able to deliver uh, relevant results for our customers in uh, relatively shorter period of time. So we're thinking about you know, three to five years is the timeline that we've kind of given uh, the system to, uh, to mature itself out. Uh, right now, we're just on the first year of making uh, the implementation happen. So, uh, um, uh, but once the, uh, the ingestion of the data starts, uh, we're fairly confident uh, it's going to be able to drive that to uh, that 400 plus year timeline of being able to catalog all this information down to about a year, maybe two years. Uh, and it, a lot of it, a lot of it really depends on, um, you know, how much, uh, how many servers and um, uh, engines that we can run simultaneously on our, uh, on our systems. So uh, a roadmap that we, you know, we started the technology evaluations uh, at, at Los Alamos back in 2016. Uh, we did, um, uh, evaluates uh, commercial products. The commercial products, most of them uh, didn't really pass our evaluation. One of them, uh, uh, Palantir, uh, did actually do some of the stuff that, uh, that we did uh, that we wanted. Their classified functionality was um, kind of uh, questionable because um, the types of uh, classification restrictions that we have, uh, they would have to build those out. They weren't uh, built into the system. So we started this pilot with Titan uh, Technologies, uh, with Titan on the right in uh, 2020. Uh, again, this year we're uh, building it on the uh, classified environment. I think it's probably going to uh, take another uh, year for us to uh, get a test system out on the classified, mainly because there's a lot of security um, 
issues that we have to deal with on the classified side. It's not really a technology issue. And then um, uh, a year later, we're hoping to expand that out to additional data sources if the initial data source, um, the test source that uh, we think uh, uh, is going to work uh, properly. And then, uh, and then we'll, we're going to evaluate that in a couple of years, two, three years, to see uh, where we're going to expand um, uh, this out to. So uh, uh, this is one of those projects, you know, as the director of the center, I'm kind of managing personally because it's, uh, it's a very large project, multi-million dollars uh, per year. Uh, so I'm personally managing this, this project, but I do have a, a project manager, um, uh, Julie Mays, who's... Uh, who does a lot of the day-to-day -day, um, uh, working with the vendors and our internal staff to, uh, uh, to implement this project. So I think that's all I've got. So um, Cliff, I'll turn it over to you. And if uh, folks have any questions, I'm happy to uh, try to answer them. So I, I see one question online, um, any chance Titan on the red um, would be made available to other institutions. So. Uh, Titan on the red is a, a semi-commercial product. Uh, and I say semi-commercial because it was actually develop, developed for the intelligence community, um, but they have a version of it that uh, uh, that, um, that, that uh, company is selling to the commercial space. So if you uh, uh, send myself or uh, Julie an email, uh, we can put you in touch with, uh, with the folks that, uh, um, in that company, and then they, that, and then you can have further discussions with them. Um, okay, and then the, we've got another question from uh, Alex. Um, I'd like to know what human-based ontologies you're using. It sounds quite like what we're doing with the hierarchical uh, clustering of scientific research problems that we've extracted, although our timeline is by Christmas. Okay, uh, I um, the human ontologies that we're doing is, um, uh, okay, so we're taking some commercial ontologies and we're taking some uh, um, uh, open source ontologies, and these ontologies are basically related to um, uh, to science, uh, engineering, and then the human uh, generated ontologies that we're using are uh, are being built in house. Uh, we have a team of uh, two people who are, are ontologists, you know, uh, university trained ontologists. Um, that are building out those ontologies. Those ontologies are specific for the types of work that we do over here. And, uh, you know, the, for those of you uh, may know in history, Los Alamos is the uh, play, birthplace of uh, uh, the atomic weapons. So uh, the bulk of our work that we're doing over here is related to nuclear weapons. Uh, so uh, the ontologies that we're building over here are classified uh, ontologies. Um, specific for the data set that we have uh, at Los Alamos. Um, okay, so we've got another one uh, saying, can you say a bit more about ontology that powers the search, also search by concept uh, or by full text search combinations? So uh, the, uh, the ontology, I think we've already talked a little bit about that. It's, uh, uh, it's a combination of uh, scientific uh, and engineering ontologies that are commercially available and through open source uh, um, sources, and then our internal um, uh, man-made ontologies that we're, our st internal staff is working on. Um, the the search is actually a fairly robust search. It's it's actually more in depth than what you get with Google. So you can do the full text uh, search by uh, you know typing in um, uh, stuff into the search engine, but then it also presents you with uh, additional capabilities where it'll uh, graphically show you relationships between the search terms. So it'll say, okay, if you're searching for, uh, let's just say Oppenheimer, uh, here's all the stuff about Oppenheimer and graphically it'll say, well, Oppenheimer is also connected to this guy whose name is also Oppenheimer who happens to be his brother, or it also happens to be connected to, um, uh, uh, to UC Berkeley because uh, you teach stuff at UC Berkeley. So there, here's some additional stuff that you may want to uh, check out with uh, UC Berkeley. So it's, it's actually a fairly robust uh, system that, um, uh, that this team is going to be rolling out. Um, okay, so the next question is, I think you mentioned Palantir. Have you tried their interface with library metadata production folks? Anything you can share? Um, so uh, Palantir, we honestly, uh, we didn't pursue it further than, um, than the pilot 
program that we did uh, back in uh, uh, 2017. Uh, uh, I mean, th th there would have been too much build out on uh, on the Palantir side uh, for the classified work uh, that was specific for the type of things that we were doing. Uh, plus, their cost structure was a little bit more uh, than uh, than what we could um, um, work with uh, over here in Los Alamos. So that's when we started looking uh, at other alternatives uh, and the other alternatives, uh, uh, you know, it says uh, the pilot with the uh, uh, Titan on the right started in 2020, but the actual uh, search for an alternative system started in 2018. And that's that's when I started uh, leveraging some of my connections within the intelligence community to see if uh, there was uh, uh, companies out there that uh, could do uh, similar type of work. Okay, um, so another question that says, uh, are any data visualization features built in the search other than the graph related disambiguation that you already mentioned? Um, that's the only um, uh, data visualization tool that we've uh, uh, contracted with this company for. Uh, I, I'm sure there's others that we could maybe at a future date and we're, uh, we're not, um, so uh, we're not actually uh, doing data visualization, we're doing information visualization. So uh, data visualization, at least the, in the way that we use it over here, is taking the raw data uh, that's contained within our documents, uh, let's say tables and graphs and charts, and uh, doing a visualization of that. We're only doing uh, uh, the visualization of the PDF documents. It's, uh, and, then the, uh, and then the visualization of how they interrelate with other documents within our collections in terms of the authors or, um, or, uh, um, uh, or the subject area. Um, another question, how many staffers are working on these projects and labs? Um, okay, so the total number of people that, that are within the NSRC is uh, roughly about uh, 70 people. Um, so it's for some of the major university libraries, you know, that's a tiny amount, but for our, uh, for the amount of customers that we service, that's actually a fairly large uh, number of uh, staff. Um, uh, the, the, uh, as far as the digitizing folks themselves, it's about uh, 20 people. Uh, and we're in the process of hiring quite a few more because I, I, we've stood up the labs, but they're not fully staffed yet. So we're, uh, we're still going through the process of staffing them. Um, as far as the projects go, this uh, uh, Titan Technologies, uh, Titan on the Right uh, project, uh, we have a fairly large team uh, with our vendor that's supporting us. Uh, I would say it's probably about um, uh, maybe about 15 or 20 people. And then uh, we've got another um, uh, sm much smaller team within uh, Los Alamos that are working on implementing it uh, on our system. So I think it's about uh, five or six people that are uh, working on our side over here. Got a lot of questions there. Um, let, uh, let me jump in with one, if you'll allow sure. me, um, since uh, we seem to have fielded everything in the chat. So I'm just thinking about the um, the uh, scanning and OCR side of this, because um, you you might you have you have a lot of material going back into the '40s, '50s, '60s um, uh, of the last century, which is going to be typewritten for sure. Often copied copies of typewritten manuscripts of not necessarily wonderful quality. And then as a bonus problem, it's got mathematics in it. Um, and at least back in that era, um, the way I often saw that done is you would actually handwrite in some of the um, things like integral signs and Greek letters rather than uh, particularly in the era before when you had the um, uh, IBM Selectric balls that you could swap out for math um, uh, symbols. Um, how 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 well is the um, the optical character recognition working on that kind of material? That seems really challenging to me. So uh, we have tested this uh, out with uh, typewriter uh, typewriter fonts, uh, uh, even the older stuff, and it does recognize uh, the material. Um, there are limitations in terms of uh, uh, 
uh, you know, when you digitize something uh, in the old days with um, with typewriter stuff, there was a lot of hyphenation. So the the system doesn't correct the hyphenation, and that's intentional uh, because uh, uh, there's always an ambiguity of whether or not that hyphen was intended to be there, or if it's just uh, at, at the break of a of a sentence or a break of a uh, of a word. So that stuff is not correct. In terms of uh, uh, um, the the formulas and everything. There's actually some massive research going on uh, in at different universities to, to do uh, to try to detect uh, um, the computer generated uh, uh, formulas as well as handwritten formulas. That work is still ongoing. Uh, our system is not going to be able to um, uh, solve that problem, uh, uh, at least in the first revision. As far as the handwriting stuff goes, uh, we have quite a bit of stuff within our collection that has handwriting stuff. Um, but uh, at least my uh, uh, look at the vast majority of stuff, the vast majority of stuff, uh, I would say like, I don't know, 70, 80, 90% of the stuff we have is typewriter stuff or computer generated uh, font stuff. Uh, they do, there are documents with uh, handwritten stuff on, on the margins. Uh, there are uh, uh, notebooks that have handwritten stuff. Uh, but that material is really in the minority. It's the majority of stuff is the typewriter stuff. Uh, this system will be able to de detect uh, handwriting uh, fonts, uh, handwritten stuff at probably uh, version two or version three, because that is part of our game plan uh, to implement. But it's just not, uh, I, I want to concentrate on the, the bulk of the material first before we start going um, some of the um, necessary, but you know, there, there are, uh, these are would end up becoming side projects, but they're, they're not in the uh, in the game plan, at least for the next right. couple of years. Okay, well, thank you. Um, I think we are at time. Um, I fear we are at time because uh, there's certainly there there's a lot of fascinating aspects to what you're doing, and I'm very grateful to you for coming and sharing it. Um, uh, just the scale of this is uh, really pretty, um, pretty breathtaking. And uh, I, I wish you a lot of success with this. And uh, I hope when you, uh, uh, you know, get the get this rolled out, um, you'll, you'll think about giving us an update on, uh, on how it's all playing out. Um, but thank you so much for coming and sharing that. And I suspect um, there are folks who will want to follow up. Uh, various things with you um in the chat sure uh, I, I'm, I'm available via email or via chat and uh, uh again uh, cliff thank you for inviting me really thanks it. for coming and we're now going to just take a brief pause while we set up for the uh final um uh, project briefing for today <laughs>